Good morning. Well, it's morning for me. Ooh. That's going to be a little bit of an echo if I don't get rid of that. Sorry for the weird noise. Welcome to the Rosa Reading Group. Today, we're going to be adjusting our levels a little bit. Uh, so it's not quite so peaky. Today, we are going to be looking at a new paper. Uh, SecBot, a business-driven conversational agent for cybersecurity planning and management. Um, and I will say uh, from the outset that I don't know that much about cybersecurity, especially corporate. Morning. Well, it's morning for me. <laughs> Better. Uh, sorry about that. Wow. Apologies for the audio poison that just happened. I'm a little facile this morning, apparently. Um, but we're going to be reading this paper. I'm excited. I don't know that much about cybersecurity. Um, I know, like, the sort of general, you know, miasma that you pick up because you work in tech, but not like a whole bunch. Um, so I think I might actually be like a good target end user for this assistant based on, on sort of my early skin. Uh, and it's by a bunch of researchers from uh, the University of Zurich in Switzerland and also the Federal University of Rio Grande do, do Sul in Brazil. So uh, collaboration between a couple of different departments. Um, First author, Muriel, Muriel Franco, I might be saying that wrong. Uh, yeah, let's hop in. And this was published at uh, an IEEE conference that I don't have the name of uh, to hand, but Amina, hey, welcome, welcome. Well, let's get going. Abstract. Businesses were moving during the past decades towards full digital models, which made companies face new threats and cyber attacks affecting their services and consequently their profits. To avoid negative impacts, companies' investments in cybersecurity are increasing considerably. However, small and medium-sized enterprises operate on small budgets, minimal technical expertise, and few personnel to address cybersecurity threats. In order to address such challenges, it is essential to promote novel approaches that can intuitively present cybersecurity related technical information. Uh, and definitely in the US, I think this is, has been a couple of um, uh, pretty well publicized cybersecurity attacks in the last year or so. There's one with a water supply in Florida. There was one, um, a lot of municipalities have been being held ransom. Um, so very, very relevant. I realize those are government entities, but I think that um, a small town, I would probably call a small to medium sized enterprise. I think. Uh, in order to address such challenges, I don't remember if I read the sentence or not, it is essential to promote novel approaches that can intuitively present cybersecurity related technical information. This paper introduces SecBot, a cybersecurity driven conversational agent, i.e., chatbot, for the support of cybersecurity planning and management. SecBot applies concepts of neural networks and natural language processing to interact and extract information from a conversation. SecBot can A, identify cyber attacks based on related symptoms. So that seems really useful, like a way to um, be like, hey, probably something's going on, FYI. Indicate solutions and configurations according to business demand. So thumbs up, here's what you should do. And provi provide insightful information for the decision on cybersecurity investments on risks. Um, so I'm guessing this is sort of like, maybe it's not like, uh, it sounds like these first two things are for like a situation that's going on right now. And the last one is like, okay, to prepare for stuff in the future, what should you do? Uh, a formal description has been developed to describe states, transitions, a language, and proof of concept implementation. A case study and a performance evaluation were conducted to provide evidence of the proposed solution's feasibility and accuracy. Uh, <laughs> uh, Nick says, uh, he just saw my Rosette Summer video. It's uh, less than 20 minutes and I tried to explain it all. Uh, yeah, I did definitely talk a little bit fast in that one, but hopefully it was, it was helpful for folks. All right, uh, and just as an FYI, um, I know often with these system papers, we tend to go a little bit long. I'm gonna be leaving right at 10 because I got something right after this, but uh, if we don't finish the paper this week, we will talk about it next week, wrap it up then. Uh, okay, so they've got a full system, uh, they're going to describe it, and then also some system evaluation, and uh, yeah, really interesting. Again, a problem space I don't know a whole lot about, so I am excited to learn. 
Introduction. Businesses become proportionally more exposed to cyber attacks as their reliance on information and communication technology increases. ICT. Oh, I don't think I've run into that, uh, that particular phrasing before. As a result, companies' investment in cybersecurity naturally increase. While large companies such as banks and governmental entities spend significant funds on adopting cybersecurity best practices and training and training dedicated technical personnel at I garden path myself, small and medium enterprises often underinvest and lack efficient strategies to protect their information technology services and value chains that are part of five. That's a citation. I guess we could scroll down, but I'm guessing that I'm not going to have anything insightful to say about any of the citations um, that aren't directly related to the NLU because, again, sort of outside of my, uh, my area. Mm. Also, speaking of uh, Raza conferences, L3AI for this year, uh, keep your eyes peeled. We're going to start uh, going to start talking about it a little bit more publicly. So another online conference. Where was I? In addition, SMEs tend to show a misperception of their cybersecurity conditions, as a recent survey reveals. While 60% of US and UK SMEs believe their businesses are unlikely to be targeted by cyber attacks, the reality is the opposite, with a significant amount of breaches and cyber attacks targeting SMEs. Um, which makes sense. Like, I... I, I, if I were forced to pick a company to do a cyber attack against, I'm probably not going to pick like, you know, Oracle or like a really big company. Uh, I'd probably pick, you know, a small company that just got started and probably hasn't had a lot of time to think about cybersecurity. Uh, the adoption of efficient cybersecurity strategies in SMEs is challenging because of the constraints mainly associated with the lack of a cybersecurity budget, unskilled human resources, so people who don't know about cybersecurity, and limited time allocated to cybersecurity planning. This can lead to disastrous impacts on business, including financial losses due to cyber attacks, mitigation of costs, and inefficient management of protections. Um, so basically they're saying these smaller companies don't have a lot of resources to handle stuff, and as a result, they got got. Ah, uh, Faisa! Good to see you! It's been a minute! Welcome, welcome! Hopefully you're doing good. I know stuff's a little, uh, a little hairy in Ethiopia right now, so... But from a human-centric perspective, simplifying the cybersecurity decision-making process requires clear and straightforward approaches for SMEs. It is essential to promote novel approaches that present cybersecurity technical information in an intuitive, user-friendly way, allowing less skilled personnel to make informed decisions while maintaining a proper level of protection of their businesses. SMEs can benefit from adopting faster and cheaper cybersecurity strategies, e.g. by minimizing human experts' need while reducing costs by efficiently investing in defense mechanisms. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and I think, I mean, where they're going to go from this is that you should do is conversational AI for it. Um, but it's interesting because they're talking about like a number of things that I having read their description of the problem does make it seem like a good use case for a conversational AI. Because, you know, if uh, I were head of, you know, IT for a small company, um, again, I, I sort of like know about general like cybersecurity hygiene and, and, and protecting, but um, would I necessarily know, you know, what are the hallmarks of, you know, the early stages of an attack when we can still do something about it? And how would I, you know, how would I go about mitigating it? I, I don't know, right? So I would need so some sort of like guidance that meets me where I am as like a technical person who knows, sort of like generally knows about cybersecurity but doesn't have a lot of domain expertise would be really helpful in this uh, hypothetical situation. Uh, as I said, pray for us. Yeah, um, you all are my thoughts. You really are. So a lot of uh, uh, a lot of things about this particular thing. There's a lot of qualities of this particular challenge that I think does make it a really good place for conversational AI, because I think if you can imagine the easiest way to learn about something that you don't know anything about, like you don't even know what type of questions to ask, is almost always to talk to somebody who knows the thing pretty well and is willing to like make time. Um, 
Yeah, anyway, so, uh, and here's where they're like, hey, our uh, solution is uh, conversational agents, i.e. chatbots. Have been recently highlighted as an ally to enhance business cybersecurity adoption by sharing network and security information with non-technical staff. Advances in natural language processing, driven by novel machine learning techniques. Uh, well, interesting, a lot of the neural, well, transformers are new, but a lot of the sort of like basic neural network architectures were proposed years and years ago and just like, there was not enough data or compute to do them. Led to conversational interfaces capable of extracting meaningful information, NLU, and simplifying interactions between humans and machine dialogue policies. Compared to e.g. command line and technical dashboards, chatbots provide a straightforward interaction using natural language, enable faster decision making, and speed up complex processes. Yeah, so specifically thinking about <laughs> would this be better as a dashboard for this particular and again i'm sort of like guessing a lot about what cybersecurity looks like um but dashboards for me i would build a dashboard if i have multiple things i'm going to be checking on them often and i sort of know what i'm looking for right so uh time time series uh, plots are something that often you'll see at a dashboard because they get updated um, and someone who is familiar with the time series will be like oh yeah this is normal seasonality uh, but I can still like you know you can even do decomposition and find the trend or like oh that's a sudden spike or like oh this is an anomaly I should dig into that a little bit more um, but you have to really like in order for a dashboard to be helpful you have to understand what you're looking at and if you're looking at a large number of things and there is one thing that is important, but it's something that you don't know a lot about and you can't just like pick that out visually from a, an array of visual information that could really slow down your ability to to handle it. Right. Um, so a good example for me is if I'm looking at a dashboard of like an NLP project and language identification is part of the project and I suddenly see a lot of, you know, a new language showing up almost always it's not often like i know that language id programs will uh group types of text that are not actually part of a language as being similar to that language so oftentimes people who are using like you know character substitution to make their text look exciting by sort of mining the weird parts of unicode will be misidentified um any sort of like copy pasted um i don't know if y'all saw that twitter meme a while ago where it was like an ascii art of like a brick wall and then a bunny peeking around the brick wall and it would say something that would probably not be identified as english that would i mean maybe korean possibly because i think it was built using some hangul characters the ascii art of the brick wall um but so if i see like a sudden new language popping up as being widely used in a data set um over time I know that that's something to look into, but if you don't know that, you might be like, oh yeah, cool, we've got a lot of Korean speakers, fantastic, we should like focus on this target market, even if it's not necessarily what's reflected in your data. And if I was looking at like a big, you know, cybersecurity dashboard, I wouldn't know what to focus on. So having a way to identify what's important and then direct people's attention to it, I think a chatbot can can do better than a conversation, than a, than a dashboard, because you're talking about one thing at a time, right? It's more more linearly uh compressed anyway just just my thought um yeah but there's definitely situations where i would want uh, a dashboard over conversational AI. like if every morning i log in and i look at five graphs and i'm like okay um so like youtube analytics right i like i know what i'm looking for in youtube analytics um and i just want to like see the graphs really quickly i don't have a whole conversation about it having a conversation would actually make that interaction slower Anyway, sort of discussion about when is when is good to chatbot uh, and speed up complex processes. So that's sort of what I was talking about there. Uh, the cyber helpline chatbot in the UK was proposed to deal to was proposed to provide immediate advice to citizens on how to deal with cybersecurity issues. However, even with those benefits, the employment of chatbots in the context of SME cybersecurity is still scarce and limited to very specific scenarios. Hence, the current state of the art neither fully covers the demands of SMEs nor considers barriers for cybersecurity adoption in SMEs, e.g. awareness of standards, limited internal knowledge, and lack of clear implementation guidelines. Citation. Uh, and I'm guessing that that citation is talking about the things that SMEs struggle with with regards to cybersecurity. 
In this content, context, SecBot, a cybersecurity driven conversational agent, is introduced here to help non expert users take informed and efficient cybersecurity decisions, reducing the risk of economic impacts due to business disruptions. Um, and also like harming users, I think is a pretty, a pretty big problem with cybersecurity attacks. So, um, you know, exposing sensitive user data, always a problem. Um, other things, that's, that's the one that comes to mind off the top of my head. Or like in the, in the case of the uh, water treatment plant, they, the, the attack was trying to like change the um, amount of additives to the water to make it unsafe to drink. So again, that would be a pretty big issue. Um, it didn't happen, but that was sort of the, the aim of the attack. For that, SecBot is designed to interact with non-experts to extract information on cybersecurity demands and business requirements. SecBot is able to understand symptoms and business risks to correlate with potential cyber attacks, helping users comprehend incidents and their impacts, provide recommendations for actions in different levels of abstraction, such as which efforts are required to avoid or to mitigate problems, and support the configuration, e.g. in-house firewall or acquisition of protections, preparing actions, e.g. command lines or configuration files, required to, oh, I see what they're saying. So I'm just gonna go back and, and go through this again. Uh, Nick says here in the UK, there are a lot of phishing attacks. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, okay, so what's it doing? Uh, first of all, you tell it what's happening and it uh, understands symptoms and business risks to correlate with potential cyber attacks. So you're saying, hey, this is what's happening currently, or like, this is what we're worried about. Uh, and uh, the assistant will help you, you know, understand what's going on and what might happen as a result of these things happening. Uh, it'll be like, hey, here are some things you can do. Uh, and then this one's really interesting. Um, supporting the configuration or acquisition of protection. So like helping you set up the firewall um, and preparing action. So here it sounds like it's almost um, potentially running command line code or generating configuration files uh, required to configure or deploy a solution. So letting you know what's going on, suggesting what you can do, and then really making it as easy as possible for you to do the things uh, to, to protect your small and medium enterprise. The feasibility of SecBot is evaluated by conducting a case study and by analyzing its performance. Um, yeah, this is really interesting. This sounds like a very user-centered um, uh, sort of approach to, to this design process. And they're really thinking about, hey, how can I make this as easy as possible for someone to actually do the recommended cybersecurity stuff? Um, yeah. The remainder of this paper is organized as follows. Related work on chatbots is reviewed on section two. The SecBot solution is introduced in section three where design details are provided. Section four provides an evaluation of SecBot's performance, including a case study and discussion of achievements and limitations. Finally, section five draws conclusions and comments on our future work. All right, and we might get through it, we'll see. Conversational agents have been widely used in a variety of areas and different ways, absolutely. A survey on enabling technologies and application scenarios is presented by one, providing an overview and comparison on various natural language, uh, natural language processing techniques and outlining significant factors that impact the design of a chapa. What is this paper? I've got to read this. A survey on chatbot design techniques in speech conversation systems. Oh, is this speech based? If they're surely not, if they're generating files then it must be text based. I guess you could trigger the generation from speech, but I'm, I would be surprised if this was a voice system. I probably wouldn't have it as a voice system. Um, not least because, um, it is much easier to record someone's audio without them knowing than it is to, uh, you know, Presumably the chatbot's running in a secure space. I don't know. Anyway, um, there are security risks with, with voice stuff is just what I'm saying there. Uh, interesting. Yeah, this may be our 2015. Ooh, I was gonna say this might be our next paper, but this is uh, a little bit 
a little bit on the older side for the space just because things have been moving so quickly. Uh, but could be a good reference for y'all. Uh, for, so for reference, I often talk about sort of bidirectional LSTMs as being the thing that came before Transformers. Uh, 2015 would have been before bidirectional LSTMs with attention were big. Uh, so would have been quite a very different way of, of thinking about things. Uh, uh, Teaching Machine says, can you talk about my bot as a case study? Uh, next week on Friday, I can provide a detailed video document about my bot's purpose and all. Uh, yeah, feel free to, feel free to send it over. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to promise anything, uh, but I, I would personally be interested in, in taking a look. So, yeah. All right. Well, NLP techniques vary according to input data. The authors recommend limiting the scope of a chatbot, yes, and avoiding general purpose agents that often require more comprehensive knowledge bases. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked a little bit about uh, some of the ways we can do knowledge bases a couple weeks ago, and general purpose chatbots in particular are hard. Thus, different fields can benefit from chatbots trained and designed for specific purposes, absolutely task-oriented dialogue systems, such as self-driving network management. I have no idea what that is. Uh, some sort of network thing. As the extraction of the correct information from a conversation is critical, 34, surveys recent advances in named entity recognition by using machine learning models, which shows, e.g., that neural network models outperform other models to recognize entities. I am going to go look at paper 34. Is this a link? Be sure, right? I know I've mentioned this before. I hate this particular type of uh, a citation system. So it's from Coling, which is a good conference, and it is from 2018. So I don't... I, I don't know that I'd call this recent because this paper was published in 2020. So, uh, and this is, uh, this is very, um, this is one of those things that's very discipline specific. So like in, I guess, anatomy two years ago probably would be considered recent. Um, and NLP tends to move much faster. The publishing cycle is much faster. Uh, so for us, I would say like within the last six months is what I would consider recent work in NLP. Um, and that's, that's disciplinary, so I'm, I'm not going to... It just depends on the field you're working on. Uh, yep, and I, I would say that in general, that's definitely what we've seen. Um, that if your entities vary a lot, then yes, absolutely, neural networks work great. That's what, part of the reason we built Diet. Uh, the, the other reason is intent classification. That's what the I is. Um, if you have an entity that is always going to follow a specific format, so in you know, I guess the cybersecurity genre domain, a URL for that, I would still honestly use regular expressions. Um, it's just faster. Uh, I mean, faster at inference time, not necessarily uh, faster to write a good and robust regular expression. Which is why we use Duckling, where someone else has done it. 33 prevents, presents a generic chatbot model to answer customer requests based on social media interactions. Uh, the authors employ deep learning techniques based on long short-term memory, so this is probably going to be a little bit more recent. Uh, networks to generate responses, ooh, response generation, okay, for customer service requests on social media. Mm -hmm. In contrast to one, which limits the learning scope, 33 uses a comprehensive learning base relying on using social media, mainly Twitter. Uh, an example of an extensive application of a chatbot is Microsoft uh, Xiao Ice. I don't know that that said ice. Um, as of today, it covers 66, 660 million users across five different countries. Wow. Averaging 23 conversations per second, gathering data from multiple social networks, mainly from China. I sort of heard of this, but I, I wasn't very familiar with the details. So that's, that's quite large. Uh, the tool provides excellent lessons from the development, improvement, and applications of chatbots. Its learning algorithms have been used to infer semantics in massive amounts of data to provide personal assistance, emotional connections. Interesting. Um, so emotion detection stuff is usually more in the sentiment realm than, or the pragmatics realm than the semantics realm. Semantics generally deals with like um, the formal 
representation of meaning and not necessarily sort of uh, the social context or the, the meaning that's built as part of social context, which falls more into pragmatics. Um, and I guess you could argue that semantics isn't, sorry, that um, sentiment isn't uh, pragmatics either and is some sort of, um, you know, metalinguistic feature, but I would probably call it pragmatics. Every time I take a sip of coffee, it just splashes up. Uh, I'm using actual, uh, actual thoughts from this. Okay. Other relevant applications are seen in 36 and 16, in which the uses of chatbots is proposed as a hook for identifying criminals on the internet and as an ally to cyber pedophile, cyber pedophile identification. Um, 36, I'm not super, I'm a little bit worried about. Uh, and I have heard of this other project, 16, let's go back and take a, take a look. So the idea there is that it's an assistant that poses as a child. Um, and at Raza, we always, our recommendation is almost always never to pretend that you're a human. Um, but the, uh, from 2013. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure this is that project. Uh, but the point here is that it is pretending to be a human because a human pretending to to do that would, you know, cause themselves psychological harm. Um, so I can see the I can see the argument for that. I also. Um, I don't know, so I, I just like the, I'm not a lawyer, I'm thinking about things like entrapment, I'm thinking about things like, uh, you know, false accusations, and that's just sort of what I'm, what I'm thinking about at the moment, I would talk to a lawyer. Um, I would not, in general, probably endorse these particular uses of a chatbot. Uh, personally, just as an individual. Specifically related to information security, Eleven investigated chatbots as a tool for IT security training, providing hints and elementary training steps concerning the handling of passwords, privacy, and secure internet browsing. Uh, Amina says, what type of business will need this assistant? So for the <laughs> criminal detecting ones, I don't know. Um, my my guess is that I believe that those were working with law enforcement agencies, which I mean, we can talk about <laughs> law enforcement agencies as, as something separate. Um, but the this paper in particular is focused on small to medium enterprises, which based on their sort of discussion throughout, I think would be both businesses, but also things like small towns or small municipalities where they don't have like a cybersecurity expert, but would still benefit from knowing more about cybersecurity. If that was your question, Amina. This tool was, uh, so this is the tool, candles, passwords, privacy, and secure internet browsing. This tool was planned to be used in large companies where employees face-to-face -face training is infeasible. 18 proposed a conversational agent to address the complexity of how to present network information to non-technical user about the behavior of IoT devices, helping uh, identify when devices are part of a botnet. Oh yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, I IoT stuff in particular, I think there's sort of a, an ethos among some people that you know, if you own an IoT device and it does something bad that you know you could have potentially prevented by taking some technical steps, that's on you. But like my stance on the matter is, I don't expect my light bulbs to be hacked, right? That's not something I've ever had to think about before, just as a you know baseline consumer. Um, so expecting people to be aware of, of threats and issues that they've never encountered before uh, in a product that they have no reasonable expectation will have that because it's not something they've ever thought about before um, seems questionable <laughs> from a sort of advocating for the user standpoint. I don't know, it's similar to sort of uh, an early electrification when um, people didn't know about like um, daisy chaining or, or pl plugging multiple plugs into each other. Um, and a lot of house fires started because people didn't understand sort of the risks associated with, you know, overloading electric circuits. Um, and the, the way that we got around that is, yeah, a little bit of education. Like I've been told not to do that, but also like 
breakers, right? Uh, and and having ways to um, safeguard users that didn't require them to be electrical engineers. And sometimes it does feel a little bit like um, a lot of the IoT Internet of Things discussion is, um, hey, you should know that something that you've never encountered before is going to be a problem, even though it's completely outside of your area of life experience. Uh, <laughs> uh, Hello Near This says, uh, criminal chatbots, they're a conversation starter. Want to buy a honeypot? Yeah. Um, yeah, I got, I got my own feelings as an individual on, on that particular application. Anyway, also, again, your, you know, general consumer of electronic devices is probably not a cybersecurity expert, is probably not going to know, like, even what a botnet is. So having a conversational interface where you can have, you know, a plain text conversation, people can express things in their own words, uh, and the assistant can be like, hey, this is a problem, this is how I know, this is what you should do, and I've already started doing it for you, and here are the specific steps that you need to take next. That sounds like a good application to me. However, none of these solutions, solutions focus on business demands or directly explore different tasks involved in the decision making, configuration, and cybersecurity management. So the cybersecurity assistants, the first one was training for really big, assist, really big companies, uh, and the second one was uh, uh, more consumer focused. Even though there exist clear indications of the benefits of exploiting AI-based chatbots for the cybersecurity field, e.g. by simplifying the access to the security information for different stakeholders, there is still a lack of work exploring that for cybersecurity adoption and management. Therefore, SecBot is designed to address this gap, mainly focusing on the demands of the SME sector, excuse me, but designing, but designed in an extensible way to cover other sector, IT sectors as well. So they're like, we're not for like end user consumers, we are for, you know, technical professionals at organizations that don't have cybersecurity folks. All right. SecBot design. Two fundamental concepts are required for conversational agents, intents and entities. I mean, Yes, I think that is a good thing to draw from the literature. Um, Y'all, you may or may not have run into this. Uh, at Raza, we are, we're slowly getting rid of intents. Probably not everywhere, but to the point where not every conversational term that a user provides needs to have an intent. Um, these concepts determine the basis to describe information uh, and flows supported by SecBot. Intents refer to the user's intentions when interacting with the chatbot, and entities are defined uh, to extract specific terms or values. Extracting entities and intent classification typically involves a machine learning architecture. While non-machine learning approaches do exist, and um, again, I recommend them for uh, very templatic intents, particularly entities, particularly, they are normally outperformed by supervised learning algorithms. Usually, in general, that's a good generalization, which can generalize the information extraction process by understanding the context of the input phrases. In the case of SecBot, a dual entity and intent and entity transformer, a uh, that's our paper, diet architecture is used for intent classification and entity extraction implemented by the Raza framework. I'm so happy they're using this. Um, the diet classifier relies on a transformer neural network to encode input text with context, conditional random fields, CRFs, to identify and extract entities from text encoded, and dot product similarity to classify the input intent. Um, and actually, we're also using that for the entities and then also the third task, which is optional and I don't know that they're using, uh, which is uh, mask word replacement and identification. While intents identify users that want to find protection according to the budget available or want to ask for help to configure efficient protection, entities are used to extract specific terms or values from the user intents to provide a correct response. To reach accurate responses, all entities are connected to knowledge databases, which describe values accepted for each of the specific entities. Okay, so doing a little bit of lookup. About 150 whew, entities are defined for entities of SecBot. I will say, a lot of entities is better than a lot of intents because it is, in general, an easier problem. Uh, new entries for these entities, as well as new intents, can be added, such that the SecBot can cover different scenarios and demands. Uh, and what I mean by, uh, so it also looks like they're they're practicing conversation-driven development. Uh, and what I mean by that is that 
entities tend to be more stable across repetitions than intents are. Um, so generally you need fewer examples of each uh, and they are less confusable with each other, just in general. After identifying the user's intent and extracting input entities from the input tax, text, the SecBot needs to decide upon which action will, it should take to best help the user. To that end, another important concept for conversational agents needs to be defined, stories. A single story defines the steps SecBot can take in response to a user's input, resulting in multiple possible conversation flows. Um, I would probably phrase that slightly differently, but yeah, I'd say so. For example, after recognizing the intent attack notification, if the next one is intent attack details, a message is sent asking for the budget available to invest in protection before issuing a recommendation. However, if the next intent recognizes problem description, a different action will be executed to identify the type of attack. Thus, the definition of stories is critical given that it is used to train the solution to recognize the context of a conversation and to select the next action or flows. So the stories are training data and uh, they help the assistant decide what to do next. Uh, so we have some different things. My window system is under a ransomware attack, uh, attack notification, attack details. It's a wanna cry attack. Uh, I think wanna cry is like still out there. Um, it's I that might have been like the earliest big uh big like cyber attack that i heard about for me personally obviously there are ones before that target the target is my database uh problem description my server is receiving a lot of requests from different ips so that could be a ddos um or you could just be going viral who knows could be either solution config i want to block an syn flood using my ip tables yeah, <laughs> probably not a phrase that I would use uh, based on my particular uh, experience because I don't know what an SYN flood is. Uh, support solution, how can I block a specific port using UFW? Should I invest in back backups against ransomware impacts? So whether this is a, a good thing to do or not. Uh, and then critical data, I have almost 10 terabytes of critical data. Whew. Uh, I hope that these are not real things that happen to real people, but I know that they are at some point. Uh, and then various entities that were were removed from these. Um, and it looks like a couple of these are uh, probably shared. So like this uh, solution here, a target here, attack name. Uh, so some of these are, are shared across different, uh, some of these they expect to find in different intents. They will always be extracted regardless. SecBot supports functions that can be run as an action in response to the user's inputs according to the identified intent, such as providing feedback messages, running arbitrary code, i.e. custom actions, or listening for new inputs. Okay, so it sounds like they've, they've written some of their own custom actions to do different stuff. Based on that, SecBot implements different custom actions. Let's check out these sections. They run actions according to different scenario flows. These custom actions involve finding the best solution for a request, identifying the type of attack based on symptoms, helping during the configuration of in-house protections, and calculating metrics related to economic impacts of different cyber attacks. So, um, oh, so this is just an example of the, uh, uh, the entity extraction. During the training phase of the SecBot, Besides database entities and intents, different stories have to be defined for the supervised learning uh, to allow the implemented Rosin neural network algorithm to obtain sufficient knowledge to extract and process information. Thus, it is possible to determine which action to take next during a conversation correctly. Usually. These stories were defined to cover SecBot scenarios, being able to predict a correct flow based on an identified intent. Two approaches are defined to describe different scenarios and to guide users during the interaction with the SecBot. The, the figure A represents the, the reactive R and proactive P approaches. I was like, those sentences don't go together. Uh, these approaches define, respectively, situations where the user wants to react to protect against an imminent attack or a user that wants to operate a better plan defining the business cybersecurity strategy. These two approaches are divided into six different flows that can be combined to provide a more accurate and complete answer to the user. Um, so starting out, uh, hey, something's going on. Here are my details. Get more information about the attack. Here's what you should do. 
Uh, this one, hey, I might be getting an attack. Um, okay, let's get more information about what's happening. Get more information about the details. Understand what your business is doing. All right, here's what you should do. Or you can go straight from the symptoms. Uh, so this is the reactive, something's happening now. Proactive, we want to get ahead of it. Um, so, hey, I've got, here's my business stuff. Or, or here are the attacks that I'm worried about. Here's my budget. Uh, and then here's my sort of... Uh, infrastructure details and what's going on, and then uh, here are the risks that I think are particularly important. Uh, and this P1, I'm guessing, is like helping them step through taking those approaches. Uh, figure one describes the finite automaton for reactive scenarios. R1 represents a conversation where the user knows the technical details of the attack and wants to know what solution matches his, her budget and demands. R2 focuses on understanding the symptoms associated with cyber attacks and problems, thus helping users find a suitable solution. Lastly, the flow results in a final state, R3, covering users that have already deployed protection solutions but need help to configure those. Uh, okay, so I'm guessing that you might spend you know, quite a bit of time within each of these flows, maybe filling out a form or providing more information. Uh, and of course, because ROS is flexible, you might go, you know, people might move through these in a different way than the finite automata um, if the, the intents are a good match for what comes next. Uh, proactive scenarios, figure one, assumes users will want to reduce economic impacts of threats to their business. Different metrics can be employed to provide useful information directly helping during the decision related to where and when investing in cybersecurity e.g. return on security investment metric is calculated using the user's inputs and business requirements to provide insights about whether to contract a solution, assume risks, or even acquire a cybersecurity insurance coverage. Furthermore, based on its knowledge database, the agent can suggest actions to reduce costs and to avoid the financial loss for specific business sectors. Um, so a lot, of, a, a lot of sort of like expert knowledge about cybersecurity has been folded into this assistant. P2 covers the conversation flow in which users want to proactively protect their systems about specific cyber attacks, want to cry ransomware or Mirai, maybe, botnet. For that, recommendations for updates, configurations, or solutions to be acquired can be provided. And P3 considers requests about the most common risks and vulnerabilities according to the business configuration, sector, and information provided. Um, okay, so it also sounds like uh, users could jump into any of these uh, conversational bits. Boo, boo, boo. A business profile descriptor based on a JSON structure as defined in the previous work, eight, can be configured by users to provide the SecBot with a detailed view about their business. This information is used for the recommendation process and steps requiring specific information on the business organization, e.g. number of employees, regulations, sector, or underlying security configuration slash demands. To choose the best solution from a list of possible protections, the SecBot is integrated with Mentor, a recommender system for the protection of services. Okay, so they're using, they're using a knowledge base for the entity. They're using a recommendation system to a recommender system to decide, help people decide what to do next. And this is sort of a, the conversational part is a, you know, an accessible front end to to get all those things going. Different custom actions are presented next to handle information obtained during the conversation, providing accurate answers for specific cases where algorithms and calculations are required to process the output, such as those specific reactive and proactive flows described. Custom actions are provided to identify a cyber attack uh, based on presented problems or symptoms, provide configurations for protections according to requests, and conduct an economic analysis based on the user's request to support decision-making. Um, okay, so they got three custom, uh, three custom actions. And I might, I've got about 15 minutes. Let me scroll a little bit and see if we have a bunch of, Uh, so I was checking to see if we had a bunch of figures so that we could read that section very quickly. And we do not. I guess the question is, to what degree is it helpful for us to really make sure we spend a lot of time digging down into all of their actions? Or would it be okay if we skimmed a little bit? I think... 
I think I'm going to go with a little bit of skimming so that we can finish this paper this time and talk about something else next time. Um, rather than really going in depth for each single one of these, uh, these custom actions. Uh, because again, usually I would just stay a little bit longer, but I got something right after this. So attack identification. Um, so here they've got uh, a bunch of um, symptoms or problems that they've gotten from the conversation that they've stored using slots. Uh, and they have created a decision tree, uh, has information about known attacks and uh, they sort of go through the decision tree. Okay, so it's they are doing uh, supervised classification based on the symptoms to try and figure out what the possible attack is. Uh, so we look at figure two. That's not what I wanted to do. Boo, boo, boo. Uh, uh, uh. There you go. Okay, so it uh, the target is like um, you know their database or their you know server, I guess, other things that could be targeted, not really my domain, uh, and then various symptoms. And then at each stage, uh, they'll sort of add additional information about symptoms until they get to uh, an attack. And I wonder if users describe symptoms are checked into the attack tree uh, can be applied to different attacks. So my question about this is, um, are they once they get a symptom, are they just ending right there? So if I if somebody says, hey, I have symptom two, knowing that symptom two can only be associated with a specific attack, uh, do they immediately end the conversation or do they continue asking for other symptoms um, even if they have enough information? So basically, do, do they walk the users through this tree or is it just they gather all the necessary features and then they search the tree? Because it sounds like that's what they're doing. Um, and it's just two different approaches. Uh, Amina says, is this consistent with forms and slots considered a recommender system? No, so a recommender system is a specific type of machine learning you know, application where you, um, you know something about the person or entity that's using the system. You have a number of things uh, and you rank the things based on how likely the person is to, to want them. Right. Uh, so a good example of a recommended system is Netflix. If you have a Netflix account and you've watched like a lot of documentaries, I like documentaries, um, Netflix recommenders, recommender system is probably going to be like, oh, I think you like documentaries. I'm going to show you more documentaries. These are the ones that are most relevant to you based on your interest. Um, so any sort of uh, personalized, um, you know, service uh, that has, you know, pieces of data that they're recommending is going to probably be using a recommender system uh, behind the scenes is what I was going for there. Yeah, that's a good question though. Uh, and you could you get the information to create a recommender system through through forms and slots. Um, protection configuration. Okay, so this is, um, they take all the symptoms, they use their decision tree and find the uh, most likely symptom, the most likely attack based on the symptoms. Uh, Psychbot also interprets requests to help for configure protection. Okay, so there, uh, looks like they've got three sort of slots that they're using here. Um, you know, what, what solutions does the person uh, already looked at or, or is interested in? Uh, what sort of things do they want to do? And what sort of attack types are they working on? Um, so here, yeah, okay, so they have an example here where they're they're pulling out a bunch of information from uh, the, the input, popping each of those into um, a, okay, so each of these are a different slot and this is the full attack name. Uh, and then they are running a custom, a custom action to, to find a recommended configuration. Um, for me, I might, because I'm not a cybersecurity person, I might not know that, you know, I should provide the target. So I might write this as a form. Um, and if this is a form and somebody fills all the slots, you know, right before the turn where you would have launched the form, you skip launching the form because the slots are already filled, um, would probably have been my, my go-to here. But um, if I knew like a little bit about cybersecurity, this might work pretty well. 
Uh, so that's what they're doing there. And then the investment. Okay, so this is configuration. And this is trying to figure out what makes the most sense for the business to invest in. Uh, and they are calculating a return on security investment metric. So, you know, it's expensive to get everybody in the company to change their password every week. Uh, they're going to forget it. <laughs> and you're going to have to do, you know, probably hire someone to handle manual password resetting. Um, so is that really worth it to you and your particular use case? Or is there something else that's a better use of your time and money? Um, or are you just okay with the the thing happening? It sounds like are sort of the things that they're considering here. Uh, I'm just going to skip this bit right here. Uh, so they're just sort of like telling you, given your things that you're interested in, what makes sense for you based on this um, ROSI metric. Uh, all right, and they created a proof of concept using 2.0. Blah, blah, blah. They built custom actions as discussed above. Uh, the knowledge databases were either plain text or as JSON files. Um, various information. Uh, oh, I had uh, that as a, as a question. Uh, uh, uh. And there. Interesting. Okay, so they must not be using TED. Um, they, it sounds like they're using the uh, Keras policy rather than the, the, the TED policy, which is a transformer policy, not an LSTM policy. Uh, and it, re it receives the user's phrase as input and actions as output. Uh, and they ran a bunch of uh, samples through. So they had uh, 958 sample turns, which is pretty good. Um, and they did some, some validation. Boo, 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 boo. Uh, and had 15 different conversation flows and all of them were 100% accurate. Um, which, mm, I would maybe be a little bit leery of 100% accuracy pretty much ever <laughs> with machine learning systems because they're, right, they're fancy guessers. They're always going to be wrong sometimes. Um, so my, I would be interested here in seeing if there was uh, a lot of variation in in user um once you started applying the system to user generated text um how well does that hold up because this suggests to me that the system is pretty good at understanding um the types of data that it's been trained on but may not generalize very well it might be overfitting uh and a single instance of secbot can handle 20 messages per second that's pretty good that is pretty solid uh and uh, running a bunch of the going through the attack decision tree uh, took less than two seconds on average, which is pretty good. Especially if you tell people like, one sec, let me consult my my decision tree or whatever it is that you're saying. So people know that it's going to be a couple seconds. Um, okay. And then they have a case study. So they popped it onto Telegram. Uh, and... Da, 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 da. Uh, you could still do it in the terminal using Raza Shell, yep. or you could use it during doing Raza X, but it sounds like they had a lot of users on Telegram. Uh, and then users started uh, a discussion and they asked for help and they talked about what was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sort of describes a lot of the other stuff and specific attacks, which I'm not super interested in. Uh, but based on the case study, it's possible to observe the feasibility of SecBot by providing interactions that cover different flows of the conversation uh, to help in relevant cybersecurity tasks. Okay, so it looks like uh, SecBot was able to handle, you know, lots of different conversations where things happened in different terms, which is fantastic. That's, you know, that's what we want with Raza. Um, so looks like it was working as intended. Uh, these scenarios encompass uh, support to react against a cyber attack, configure and manage an existing solution according to business goals. Uh, and based on the fact that they sort of talked about this action generating a JSON file, I think that instead of like, you know, I, I think that what it does is that it's like here, okay, here's your server, here's how you should change things in your server to make it more secure uh, and attain information about efficient cybersecurity planning. 
Uh, and the performance of the SecBot is highlighted by answering requests and correctly extracting the information required for these scenarios. Nice. Um, and I would really like to see some sample conversations here, but that might not have been possible with um, with their, their data privacy uh, measures, or they may not have gotten participant consent for that. So, all right. Yeah, I think, uh, and sort of talking about Raza uh, and scalability, that is, I will say, really good scalability. Uh, 20 messages per second is pretty good. Uh, and they're saying that it, this means that it can be used by many businesses simultaneously, which I think is, is pretty solid. Uh, I'm, I'm just, just sort of skimming here. Uh, so, yeah, and they're saying for future work, they might try different ML techniques. Uh, they might try deep reinforcement learning. Um, something that people might use for conversational patterns. I don't know that it's necessarily going to be the most efficient way of learning conversational patterns in terms of like uh, runtime and uh, you know, number of operations, but could definitely work. Um, yeah. Uh, and then extensive evaluations are sort of in their, their future work. So, I know that we sort of really went through the last bit, but I do have, I got three minutes. So let's, uh, let's sort of wrap up the paper. Um, really interesting application. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think my biggest sort of pieces of feedback for the authors of this paper would be that instead of, uh, expecting here, and this could just be that they didn't have time to talk about their, their, you know, full, full assistant configuration, instead of expecting people to provide, you know, uh, four slots all in the same uh, turn, which they might, right, people definitely might do this, um, really, you know, nudging users a little bit more heavily to be like, um, you know, I want to do uh, so if I said like, hey, I want to protect against an IAC MP flood, right? But I didn't tell you that I was my network and I didn't tell you. Um, so the solution I think is is uh, suggested by them. No, solution is also provided by the user. So having a way to sort of walk through and be like, okay, and what solution are you currently using? And then maybe providing examples of it like IP tables, nothing, which also is definitely a thing that uh, I can see particularly small businesses doing. Um, so that you make sure that you get all the slots to do uh, their their custom actions and make sure that you can, you know, uh, actually finish your, uh, that you have all the information that you need to do the other things that your assistant is trying to do. Because they, they did a lot of work here, um, you know, all these custom actions, they really thought about sort of the flow, they really mapped it out, and that's fantastic. Um, I would love to have seen more sort of examples of user conversations and i think that that's a, a clear next step for them is to uh really try deploying it and start in the conversational driven development process and see you know how robust this is to particular types of different particular types of users particularly ones that may not know a lot about security uh, like me so overall interesting paper i think it's a good application um and i'm interested to see what they do in the future and I'm going to call it here. Thanks so much for joining me. We'll be back tomorrow with live coding. We'll be writing texts because whoopsies, I forgot to write tests. Uh, so we will be doing that and I will see you then. Have a great day. I'll talk to you later.